You've seen this video concept before, but it's the first time on this channel, so I'm excited to do it. Today, I want to give one question that I have for every NBA team in the Eastern Conference going into next season. If you enjoyed today's video, drop a like, subscribe to the channel. Let's get into it. Starting off here with the champs, and we'll keep this one quick and to the point. Are they going to be the first repeat champions in seven years? The last six years, we've had six different champions. It is a different era in the NBA. Of course, we don't have dynasties like the Warriors or the Spurs walking around anymore. So for the Celtics, that is the number one goal. But we need to put it together. Another question I have is, uh, of course, the at the center position, are we going to have enough depth behind Chris Stapps Porzingis if all goes wrong? But as we saw last year, Al Horford can still step up, even though he's 100 years old. So the Celtics are going to be fine. But the question for them, can they be the first repeat champions in seven years? The player to watch, it's not always going to be their best player. Uh, in fact, I think it's very rarely one of their top three players. But for the Celtics, I think it's Jason Tatum. Jalen Brown got all the awards last season, right? The Eastern Conference Finals MVP, uh, the Finals MVP, right? Uh, and Jalen Brown, you can say, played a lot better than Tatum in that finals run. Now, that's a different argument for a different day. I tend to uh, stick on the side of Tatum a little bit more than the general media uh, because I understand why he was taking a step back. However, I am excited to see Tatum play this year. With all the noise, he hasn't had an MVP season yet. Last year, he was the only American as a first-team All-NBA guy. I want to see him come into this year leading this talented team that's going to win a lot of games. I want to see him go out there and have an MVP level season. Something to look out for. For the New York Knicks, will the lack of true center depth hurt us? Of course, you have Mitchell Robinson, who's going to be the day one starter. You lost Isaiah Hartenstein in the offseason. So to back him up, you have Precious Achua and maybe Julius Randle as a small ball five. Now, if two of those guys get hurt for any stretch of time, is OG and an OB going to be our center, right? Or are we going to trust uh, the Toppin brother to step up and play some big time minutes? Something to look out for. But I will say with the power of friendship, this team is going to be fun to watch. Uh, the Knicks, the player to watch for them is Mikael Bridges. You acquired him in the offseason. You're expecting him to play at a high level. And this is a guy that over the last few years has been the go-to guy in the situation that he was in. So he's played both sides of the coin. He's been the go-to guy, and he's been a complimentary piece back with the Phoenix Suns. So my question is, what is his offensive role? Last year, he was, of course, asked to do a lot more than what he was early in his career. So is he going to be a guy to give you 15 to 20 a night? Or is he just going to be kind of a spot, you know, spot-up shooter? I'm just interested to see his offensive role, especially because we know how Tibbs likes to play his defenders. Him and Josh Hart are going to be playing 40 minutes a game against the team's best players on the other side. Uh, so interested to see Mikal Bridges' impact and role in the offensive side of the ball. Uh, they're going to be fine, right? I even if he's a defender, they're still going to have OG, Julius Randle, and Jalen Brunson to carry the load. So Mikal might not even be needed on that side of the ball. For the Philadelphia 76ers, the roster's there. But will the playoff success be as well? That's my big question. The player to watch is Tyrese Maxey. Again, it's not always the best player or best players. Uh, but for this, I think it was warranted. You bring in Paul George, you know what you're getting from Paul George. right? If he can stay healthy, you know what you're getting. Jo Joel Embiid, you know what you're getting. He's going to be an MVP level player. He's probably going to win it again this year. Or, yeah, right, for a second time. But I think for Tyrese Maxey, last year, you had a, a, a crazy uh, step up, right? You took a major leap in your production. You gave the Sixers 26 and six and a half on great efficiency every single night. And we saw in that playoff series against the Knicks, there's times where if Embiid's hurting, I, I'm Tyrese Maxey. I'm an all-star level player. I can take over and lead this team uh, when Joel Embiid doesn't have it going. Right, So he's taken this, uh, this step up to an all-star level player. Does he have another step? That's my question. Right, He's super young. He's only 23 years old. Can he jump up to, let's say, 40% from three? Or can he jump up to you know eight, eight assists a game? Right? Maybe a little bit better defensive production. He's still a good defender, but can he take another step up? Right Now that you have more help with Paul George, 
in the mix. Something to look out for. But again, elite three-point shooter last year, 37% on eight attempts a game. That is up there with Klay Thompson, Steph Curry, and then boys, right? Uh, Tyrus Maxey, super young, excited to see if he can take another step, especially if Embiid starts to deal with some injuries down the stretch of the season. For the Milwaukee Bucks, a couple of disappointing years here in Milwaukee the last couple of years. Uh, but now you're in a spot where you need some people to step up. And I think the biggest question mark here, of course, you can go to Dame and Giannis. You can say, is this the last year of that big time duo or the free time duo, as they like to say? Something to look out for there. But I think my big question is also the player to watch is Gary Trent. You got him on a very cheap deal. He's stepping into a starting position on a championship caliber team. And there's going to be a lot asked for him on both sides of the ball. On one end, offensively, you got to knock down the three at a high clip, right? You're going to have plenty of open shots with Giannis commanding double teams, Dame doing the same thing. And Chris Middleton, when he gets busy, you can't really leave him open, right? So there's going to have to be bodies there. Gary Trent might be the guy they decide to leave open in this offense on a nightly basis. So he's going to have to knock down the three at a high clip. And he's also going to have to play good defense. Damian Lillard's not a great defender. He's an okay defender, right? But Chris Middleton is, he's taking a step back, but he's still an above average defender. Gary Trent's going to be the guy they attack next to Damian Lillard on the defensive side. So with two smaller guards that aren't necessarily known for defense, is Gary Trent going to be able to step up defensively? So that's my question for the Bucs. Is Gary Trent ready for his role? And if not, can you find a replacement? Because you're going to have to do it relatively quickly in this year number two of Damon Giannis, but tons of opportunity to show out for Gary Trent and uh, ultimately to get paid, right? Next off season, whether if it's in Milwaukee or another spot, big year for Gary Trent. For the Cleveland Cavaliers, I'm a homer, right? Uh, you know, I could say, is this the year we finally put it together? I'm not going to be delusional though. I think this year, the big question is, what version of Darius Garland are we going to get? Are we going to get the 2021 version where he was electric, the entire city was behind him, and it looked like he was happy and having a good time playing basketball? We haven't had that the last couple of years. Ever since we got Donovan Mitchell, there just hasn't been, they haven't been able to find a way for both of these guys to maximize, right, on the court, to be their best versions together at the same time. It just seems that Darius Garland's often the guy to take the step back. So my question is, are we going to get a guy that was on the trajectory to get one to be one of the best point guards in the league? Are we going to get the guy that should be averaging 20 and 9 a night? Are we going to get the guy that shows up in big time games in Darius Garland? Or are we going to get the same thing we've gotten the last couple of years? A guy that shrinks in big moments, can never hit his shots in those big moments or in those big time games. And that's just going to be the guy I'm looking out for. I hope Garland can bounce back. We all know the potential is there for him to be the secondary guy on this team, right? And then if you add in Mobley's progression, this team can make a Eastern Conference Finals run if everything clicks together. But again, that's a lot of ifs, right? At least from what we've seen from the Cavaliers the in the Donovan Mitchell era. But for Darius Garland, if you're for some reason watching this, just be you. Right, just be dominant, be flashy, have fun playing the game of basketball, and I think we would definitely uh, see the impact of it on a nightly basis. For the Magic, the team that we knocked out of the playoffs, uh, barely, right? I'll, I'll throw that out there, uh, but I'll take my little wins when I can get them as a Cavs fan. For the Magic, how far can this team go? Last year, of course, you shocked the world. You weren't even projected to be a play-in team, and you went all the way to be a top five seed. In the Eastern Conference, Paolo took a step up into superstardom, or at least he's on that trajectory. First time All Star in Paolo. Franz played great, right? Arguably an All Star last season. Uh, Wendell Carter had his moments, but Jen Jalen Suggs, I think, was the unsung hero of this team, playing great defense. He was technically the lead guard of this team when Markel Fultz was after he got moved to the bench. Uh, and again, in that playoff series, he took an offensive leap that was unprecedented. We didn't see that coming out of Jalen Suggs, right? Kind of looked like he was still back in college. Uh, but for Jalen Suggs, there was a great end to last season. He's going to be technically the lead guard this year, even though, again, guys like Paolo and Franz kind of lead the offense. Uh, they take turns doing that. 
But I'm looking for Jalen Suggs to be an all-NBA defender this season. And I think he can do that now, especially with a guy like KCP sitting in his ear on a nightly basis. But how far can this team go if Suggs can put it together and Franz and Paolo continue to take a step up, continue to improve? Uh, I think this team, I think a successful year would be maybe, a, you know, just winning a playoff series uh, in, in this new era of Magic Basketball. For the Pacers, we want to talk about overperforming, uh, right, or shocking the world. This is a team that was projected to barely make the playoffs, right? They were uh, going into last year a play-in team to most people, and they went all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals. Now, did they have some dominoes fall in their favor? Uh, no doubt, right? Giannis going down with an injury, uh, and or Embiid, of course, in that side of the bracket, went down with an injury. The Knicks had their fair share of injuries. And they went to the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, but I will say this. Going into next year, all right, this is a Pacers team that, you know, in, the, in last year had their fair share of injuries. And I think the biggest thing about the Pacers team this year, they're going to get a 20-point-per-game score back in their offense, right? They don't have to rely on Neesmith and Nemhard to give you offensive production. You got a natural-born bucket getter in Ben Matherin that can come in and uh, I think do some damage in 2024, 2025. For his career, he's only averaging about 15 and a half points a game. However, I think he can jump to 20. There were stretches this year where before he got hurt, he was averaging 20 to 22 points a game. Now, this team has added Pascal Siakam since then. So that's the only thing I worry about. Maybe he doesn't hit that 20 thresh mark, right? That, th that 20 point per game mark. Uh, but I think Ben Matherin is going to add a different element to this offense. He's going to open up the game, all right, for guys like Halliburton and, and Pascal and Miles Turner. He's going to give them the opportunity to, to, you know, sit more throughout the game. You know, give them opportunities to take possessions off. He is a bucket getter, right? And I think if he can do that efficiently, uh, I think the Pacers are going to be an even better team this upcoming season. But Ben Matherin my player to watch coming off that injury. For the Miami Heat, can we finally take the regular season serious? I understand Jimmy Butler's now in the news. He's looking at the Brooklyn Nets. He might be on his way out the door. But as of right now, going into next season, this team is still the same core. You have Tyler Hero, Bam Adebayo, Jimmy Butler. Now, the surrounding pieces have gotten better, I think, now uh, in year number two uh, after they lost some pieces to Cleveland and other places. I think Jaime Jaquez is going to take a step up, and he's my player to watch. Last year, he was giving you 12-4. and four. Again, another hidden gem that kind of came out of nowhere for the Miami Heat, right? Still a lottery pick. But for the majority of people, I, I'll be honest, I follow the NBA. I follow college basketball. I was overlooking Jaime Jaquez and what he could do from day number one. He proved me wrong. But, you know, I think he's going to have to take another step for this team to get back to where they ultimately want to go, which was the Eastern Conference Finals and the, the NBA Finals. If they want to get back there, Jimmy's going to have to be healthy. Bam's going to have to be healthy. How good is Kalel? Where going to be from day number one? Something to look out for. Uh, but I think Hame's going to have to take another step. Maybe we get 15 and 8 from him or 15 points and 6 rebounds a game from him on a nightly basis. I think it's possible, right? Now, Nikola Jovic is another guy that we could say, uh, is someone that we can watch out for. But I think with Bam Adebayo moving to the four this year, it's going to open up a lot for this offense, and it's going to give them a different look. Uh, I just hope that they finally take the regular season serious, get a top six seed, and put yourself in a position where you don't got to be David versus Goliath every single playoff matchup. For the Atlanta Hawks, they had an interesting offseason. You trade away DeJounte Murray, arguably an all-star guard last year, where at least the way he played at certain points in the season. And Trae Young was hurt for a lot of last season. And when he came back in the play-in, the team was a lot worse than what they were to end off the regular season. That team just, the, the, the it, obviously the chemistry was not there with DeJounte and Trey. Never was, right? But uh, now you're finally back to being solely in the Trey Young era. He's the guy in this offense. He's the guy on this team. And he's going to be looked at to carry this team like he did when they went to the playoffs against the Knicks way back, right? At this point, four years ago. Uh, I'm excited to see what Trey Young can do. But the player to watch for me, now again, they acquired him in the DeJounte Murray trade, Dyson Daniels. He is an all-NBA level defender, right? I think he has that potential down the line uh, in his career 
but he's an amazing defender. He has tons of untapped potential, and he's going to be playing next to Trey Young. So he's going to be having a lot of these tough off, uh, uh, defensive assignments uh, here throughout the season, and I'm excited to see if he can step up and, and take that step and to be an even better defender, even better offensive player next, uh, you know, with the opportunity uh, of DeJounte Murray leaving, someone's going to have to take a step up offensively. Uh, could that guy be Dyson Daniels? I'm excited to see if he can do it. But the big question, if it, this doesn't work out again, if this team goes, you know, barely makes the play in and they're out in the first or second game and they don't make a playoff run, is this the last year in the Trey Young era? That's a big question. Right, you moved off Dejounte. Uh, some teams were calling about Trey Young at the deadline. You declined him. Now is this finally the time? Is this the last year? Is this the breaking point for Atlanta and Atlanta fans? Should we move off Trey Young and let's say trade him for like you know a lot of draft capital and go after a Cooper flag? Something to look out for if you're the Atlanta fans. For the Bulls, is this the last year for Zach Levine? <laughs> a lot can be said here, right? Uh, a lot of similarities between these bottom feeders on both conferences. Um, is this the last year for Zach Levine? Last year, he was a bit of a drama queen. Uh, and I will come to the defense of Zach Levine. I think he's a tremendous basketball player. And I think even in 2024, people still look at him as only a dunker. And I think that, uh, of course, is a huge discredit to what he actually brings on a nightly basis. Elite score gives you about 20 a game on a great efficiency. Uh, now, does he have some boneheaded decisions sometimes? Some IQ issues? Uh, yes, right, with Zach Levine. But uh, I think he's still an all-star level player. He's coming back to Chicago where you had players who had great years last year. Guys like Ayudusumu, who could be the lead guard this year. Guys like Kobe White, sixth man of the year uh, last year, right? Uh, of course, you bring in some young, talented rookies. Uh, Pat Williams got paid, and he's going to be looked at to take a step up. Of course, no more DeMar DeRozan. Who is going to be that guy to, to be the lead guy this year? If it's not Zach Levine, do we trade him at the midseason mark, right? Is he a Los Angeles Laker uh, at second half of the year? Just some questions to look out for, right? What can we get for Zach Levine if this is the end of the road? But the player to watch, and you know, I hate to say this, Bulls fans, I would assume it has a case, right? Uh, of course, Pat Williams with his offensive jump possibility could be in this argument. Uh, but I, it's got to be Lonzo Ball, right? A guy that we haven't seen play basketball since January 14th, 2022. Now, if you forget what Lonzo was doing, please do yourself uh, the service. Go and look up what he was doing. All-star numbers, elite defense, giving him 20 and 8 a night. Great three-point shooting. He was finally entering the prime of his career, and then he gets hit with injury after injury, and he's finally, hopefully, without any setbacks, going to be able to return to NBA action this upcoming year. But Lonzo Ball has got to be the guy that we're all looking for uh, coming off uh, what could have been career-ending injuries. For the Toronto Raptors, did we overpay uh, for Emmanuel quickly? Now, you traded for him at the midseason, Mark, in a deal where you also brought in R.J. Barrett, uh, and you had to pay him, right? He had a great second half of the year with Toronto. He was giving them 19 points and 7 assists a night after the departure of Pascal Siakam. So quickly, you 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 know, with that production, you went out there and gave him four years, $175 million. That's a lot of money. Now, I understand Toronto's not a big market. They're not a team that's going to attract the Kevin Durant's and the Jimmy Butler's of the world. They're, that's just not realistic. I'm a Cavs fan, so I can relate. That's just not realistic for smaller markets. So you got to pay your guys, and you got to develop these guys to go out there and win at a high level. Now, for Emmanuel quickly, I don't think they overpaid. But let's say if he comes into this year and he reverts back to what he was in New York, where he's only given them 12 to 13 points a night. Let's say two or three assists, which, again, the playmaking wasn't there with quickly until this until he got traded to Toronto. He just didn't have that opportunity in New York. But if he reverts back to what he was in New York, it's going to be one of the worst contracts in the league. But I think if you're getting, let's say, 16 and 6 a night from Emmanuel quickly uh, with, again, a great efficiency and good defense, I don't think that's an overpay, right, especially for the Toronto Raptors. Now, I will say I think they are a guard away. I think if they can get this production out of quickly every single night, they're going to be a play-in team. 
And I think not only a playing team, they might be one of those teams that shock us at the end of the day, right? And if they can stay healthy, they could be one of those teams that sneaks in as the eight seed or the seven seed in the Eastern Conference uh, playoffs. Uh, I think the Raptors have that potential uh, this upcoming year. And the player to watch, of course, Emmanuel quickly. We'll keep this one quick. Brooklyn Nets, it's dark to be, it, it, uh, there's a, <laughs> it's a dark time to be a Brooklyn Nets fan, right? And that's why I am simply going to say, can we find some positives to take away from this year? Uh, you know, whether if that's you tank so bad that you get the number one pick and you can get a Cooper flag, right? Or whether, let's say Nick Claxton takes a step up. Or, right, maybe you can trade Ben Simmons. That could be a positive this year. But, you know, with Ben Simmons, Dennis Schroeder, Cam Thomas might be on the trade block. Uh, you know, Nick Claxton's your lead guy, but he's really a complimentary piece on a championship level team. It, there's just not a lot to to rave about to be a Brooklyn Nets fan at the at this moment in time. The biggest thing is, can we position ourselves and show enough promise this year with some of our younger core to entice a Jimmy Butler next offseason? Something to look out for. But for the Nets, the player to watch is going to be Cam Johnson, right? I think he's, you know, again, he's on the trade block has a decently large contract, but he's just a great 3 and D player that's going to garner interest from probably 20 teams in the NBA. Every team could use a Cam Johnson. Knockdown shooter, six foot eight, versatile defender, and also can put the ball on the floor and create for himself at times. I'm excited to see where he gets traded because I think it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when for Cam Johnson uh, this upcoming season. For the Charlotte Hornets, can we finally get this young core to stay healthy at the same time? You have so many young pieces, right? LaMelo Ball, Brandon Miller, Miles Bridges, who's still fairly young. Mark Williams, who's an underrated center. Nick Richards, right? Uh, of course, there's some guys that I'm definitely forgetting at the moment. But you have so many young players, and you just want to see them stay healthy uh, to see really what you have, right? LaMelo Ball this is a guy that's so talented. He's an all-star level player. And if he could stay healthy, I think he would have been in a one or two time all-star at this point in his career. But, you know, for his career, he's given us 20 points, seven and a half rebounds or seven and a half assists, six rebounds a night. But the problem is we're only getting that for about half the season for his entire career. He's only giving us 46 games a year with his injury history. Now, of course, that's not all his fault. Right. Uh, you could say it was the BBB shoes, right? The big ball of brand shoes uh, or, or, you know, whatever. But the mellow ball, it's not his fault that he gets hurt. Right. But uh, it, it's just a shame that we don't get to see him on the court, leading this young team, getting guys in position, right? Like Miles Bridges and Brandon Miller, helping them grow and develop to take that next step. We know how impactful a lead guard can be, especially when it's kind of a guy that can do it all like LaMelo ball. But we need him to be on the court. We need him to be healthy. And that's why he's the player to watch. I just want to see this team be healthy. I don't care if they win 10 games this year. Can you guys stay healthy and grow in some continuity with this core and go out there and have some nights where you look like you have a bright future? That's all I'm asking, Charlotte. For Washington, who's going to step up? Last year you paid and you traded for a guy in Jordan Poole. Last year, he came out, gave you 17 points a game, but that's not what you paid for. <laughs> right now, he looks like one of the worst contracts in the league in Jordan Poole. But of course, uh, I think this is going to be a big year for him. Can he bounce back? Because if he doesn't, if he can't jump up, and I'm not even saying numbers-wise. If he just can't play better this season for the Washington Wizards, he's going to be looked at as a career six-man. And as a guy that was desperately trying to get away from that, in, in Golden State, he's going to resort back to it. And I can see him probably ending up back in Golden State if that's the case going into the 2025 season. But I think, again, Kyle Kuzma, you know he's going to give you all-star production. You know, but but you're trading away guys like Denny, right? And, and, and it's like you have a lot of young pieces. Alex Saar, can he be the guy to step up? I think you have Marvin Bagley on this roster now. Can he step up? I'm looking for someone to take that step. And, and to shock us and be like, whoa, just because he's in Washington, he's not getting the attention from the media, but we can recognize he's having a tremendous season. Whether if that's Jordan Poole, Alex Saar, or anybody else on this, on this roster that is relatively young. 
I'm not looking for Jonas Valanciunas to have a great season, folks. It's just one of these young guys to step up. Just like the Wizards as well, or, or, or Charlotte, I just want to see them stay healthy as well, right? We know Kuzma's going to be great. Who else can round out the team? Give this team some hope on a nightly basis. I hope it's Jordan Poole, right? I'm not a Jordan Poole fan, but I hope that he shuts up the haters a little bit, right? For Detroit, they're the last team here. And of course, we go in order of how these teams finished in the playoffs or in the Eastern Conference last season. We'll finish off here with Detroit. I, I, I will start by saying that, sure, the Monty Williams experiment did not work and uh, it did not go as you planned. You brought in Jay, or you brought in Monty to be the veteran mouthpiece and leader for a team that could potentially make a playoff run. That didn't happen. But I think, as a Cavs fan, even though he was not fit to lead a contending team, I think he's a tremendous coach for a rebuilding team. And a team, again, we saw that with the Cavs uh, before we got Donovan Mitchell. They were a young and fun team that shocked a lot of people with how good they were uh, throughout, the, throughout that pre-Donovan Mitchell era. But I think J.B. Bickerstaff is going to be a great coach for the D Detroit Pistons. I think he's going to come in, and if this team can stay healthy, I think they're a play-in team. As crazy as that sounds, you know, again, this is a team that won 18 games last year. How much, can, you know, can we really expect them to take, a, you know, almost double their wins and make a play-in push? I think they can. Again, they need to be healthy, which they weren't for the majority of last year. And they need a coach that fits with the timeline. And that's J.B. Bickerstaff. He's a great motivator, right? He knows how to develop some of these younger players, help them stay confident throughout maybe uh, big losing streaks like the Cavs had a couple years ago. And I think guys like Cade Cunningham is going to play elite like he was last year. Jalen Duren going to be a double-double machine. But the player I'm looking out for, right, outside of Asar Thompson, is Jaden Ivey, just like Ben Matherin. I think this is a guy that, with without injuries, he was a guy that at points last year was giving the Pistons 20 points a night. And for his career, Jaden Ivey, voice crack there, right? If you made it this far in the podcast, that's bound to happen. Jaden Ivey has given them 16 and 5 throughout his career. I think he can take that step up. Let's say give him 20 points and four assists a night. Next to Duran and next to Cade, he could be that third guy. And then you add on a Star Thompson's defense and some of these other guys, is, uh, uh, some of these younger pieces that could take a step up. I think the Detroit Pistons can make a play-in push next season. I, I might have to put together a hot takes video before the year uh, just to throw that one out there and plant my flag. But Jaden and Ivy's the player to watch. Episode 205. Uh, it, it's an awesome show, right? It's an awesome feeling to come out here and talk to you guys every single week, twice a week for these podcasts. Uh, but if you made it to this point, you at least were able to put up with me so if you enjoyed, drop a like and consider subscribing to the channel. We drop four videos a week, two fantasy football and two podcasts covering the NBA, the NFL, and fantasy. We do a little bit of every, a little bit of everything here uh, on the podcast. But we're going to do this again next week for the Western Conference. Then I have some exciting series that I want to start with you guys uh, about every single NBA team leading up to the season. Should be tons of fun. I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow for fantasy Thursday for uh, week one NFL predictions. <laughs> See you guys then. Stay happy, stay healthy. Get out of here.